to uh, to uh, sing. I hadn't got my mic yet. I'll get it in a minute uh, in my closing. But j- turn to James chapter 5 while I'm introducing this. Uh, I was amazed that Brother Hayden saw that on the on the song list, Brother Randy was scheduled to sing. And so he said, you got a substitute for Brother Randy yet? I'm ready. And so he substituted for Brother Randy. Amen. I like that. Amen. You say, that's pushy. Yeah, it's pushy, but it's good. It's good pushiness, amen? Wants to do something for God, say say amen. James chapter 5, we're going to close out this study. I I tell you, I've enjoyed the book of James so much. It's on maturity. It's time we grow up. And one of the ways that we ought to grow up is, of course, don't have self-centered, selfish, uh, materialistic, sensual prayer life. We just need to pray for others, amen? We need to pray for others more than we do ourselves. It's all right to pray for ourselves. I'll show you four different prayers in 2 Timothy chapter 2. But I believe that, folks, one of the greatest things that God's called us to do is to pray for others, especially our missionaries. I went over that last a couple of weeks ago about how to pray for a missionary, and I'll give you that in uh, print um, Wednesday night if you want to get that in print. But I want to I want to just close out this book of James on one of the most important topics we could ever preach on, and that's the prayer of faith. How to pray believing, and how, how to pr- pray believing that you'll receive what God wants you to have. That's according to His will, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. So let's stand in all the Word of God, and we're going to close out this uh, uh, chapter by reading uh, verse um, 13 through the end of the chapter. The Bible says, If any among you be afflicted, let him pray. If any marry, let him sing praises. If any sick among you, Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord of the Lord. And then here's what 
the TV evangelists have all backwards. It says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that he might not reign, and it rained not for the, on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the rain brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the power of prayer. God, I thank you for the good song service we just had that we could praise you. And God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, a church that wants to step out by faith and not only support these missionaries monetarily, but support them most important of all, spiritually, by encouraging them and by praying for them, and God being a, a, a church that intercedes for them. And so, Lord, help us to uh, preach a few minutes on this uh, privilege of intercessory prayer for others. And God, may we as royal priests, uh, children of the living God, not get so satisfied with all the blessings of life, that we don't pray for those that's not blessed, those that went astray, those that are lost, those that are having hard times. And so, Lord, thank you for a praying church. And, Lord, make us a better praying church. In Jesus' name, amen. It is prayer that we change our natural strength into supernatural strength. R.A. Torrey said this. He said, uh, nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except what lies beyond beyond the will of God. And so, folks, we don't have failure in our life unless it's failure of the prayer life. We need to learn to pray. As I said this two weeks ago, I'll say it again. There's not a sin in your life, but what prayer and the right kind of prayer, prayer in, praying in Jesus' name, effectual fervent prayer, would not prevent that sin. The Bible says, could you not watch and pray? I know it's hard to pray for an hour. Try to do that this afternoon and found myself dozing off. I'll just I'll be honest with you, that's embarrassing. Amen? You wake up and say, why in the world did you fall asleep praying? But the devil wants to put the church to sleep. And the devil wants our minds to wonder. How, why is it that when we pray, sometimes crazy things race across our brain? I mean, work out things. I mean, you know, just things that don't really matter. I'll tell you why. Because the weakest... Uh, prayer warrior on his knees makes the devil tremble. And I want to tell you something, friend. We are all like passions, just like Elijah, who got depressed in chapter 19 of 1 Kings. But I want to tell you something, friend. We need to have a brokenness over our prayer life, and we need to realize that God can heal. Uh, look at verse 16. It says, um, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they have... They shall be forgiven him. Now, folks, I, I believe with all my heart there's four reasons why Christians have trouble. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says you ought to pray for wisdom that you not waste your prayer life. Number one, uh, sometimes prayer is for um, uh, because of sin. Sometimes. Not always, TV evangelists. All of them want to put, put, put it on the person that's being prayed for. The Bible says the prayer of faith will heal the sin. But also... I believe that we also get on healing ground. And that means we get the thing right with God. And then sometimes prayer is for um, uh, troubles for conditioning. God has us go through a situation like I went through in my childhood so we can help others with the comfort that we receive. Then sometimes it's for a change, miraculous change. But it's always, now always, four C's, and I've given it to you 1,485 times, but I want to give it to you one more time. It's always for conforming. Always. All things work together for the good of them that love God and called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28 and verse 29 says that you might be like Jesus. So we know that, folks, all trouble make, should make us more like Jesus, not more like the devil. 
But sometimes trials and sickness come in our life because we sin. And so in this case, I believe that the, these, these elders knew that and they came and they said, hey, listen, you need to get right with God. In verse 16, it says, confess your faults one to another that the, uh, and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now, that's conditional. It says you confess your faults. You get right with God. You sin publicly in this church. You need to make it right publicly. Uh, we've had some terrible things happen in this church, and I told the people, I said, you need to make it public that you, what you did and apologize to the whole church. They said, well, they did. I don't know if they did or not. But I want to tell you this, friend. If it's private, you ought to keep it private. Don't hang your dirty laundry in front of the whole world. Amen? I mean, don't promote sin. But I want to tell you something, folks. There's a realm of this. And I want to say this. that The elders went to the house and anointed with oil. Now, the oil is not healing oil. Uh, Warren Wiersbe says it's massaging oil that you ought to go to the, go to the doctor as you pray. Well, I don't believe that. And, you know, I love to read after Dr. Warren Wiersbe, but he's wrong there. That oil is a medium of faith. Uh, I used to have some oil, three-in-one oil. That, no, not, not really. Uh, uh, under the pulpit, and if people would request me to anoint them with oil, I wouldn't do it publicly because uh, people would be like the charismatic church and they'd make that an emphasis. The greatest miracle is the healing of your soul. Amen? So we don't have healing lines around here. We have soul-winning lines. The great, I mean, what's the problem, man, if he gets healed of cancer and dies and goes to hell. That's temporary healing. But I do believe in healing. But I don't believe in healers. Apostolic gifts passed away. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. 2 Corinthians 14, 14. 12, 14, excuse me. The gifts of apostle. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, if you want to turn there with me, that there was authenticating signs in the apostles' days. And I want you to look at that. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. Because uh, you need to know this in this wacky day that people uh, have all kinds of sign signals. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You ought to seek after the Savior. Amen. Don't go around seeking after signs. I don't even want to mention this, but I will in just a minute. Where was we going? I was just checking. Amen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 3, okay? Um, you know, sometimes a lapse of memory makes you listen. Amen. And uh, sometimes, if I could find Hebrews real quick, I'd be there. Okay, Hebrews 2, 3. The Bible says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which was first began to spoken to us by the Lord, and was confirmed in us by them that heard Him? Them that heard Him was the apostles. Now listen what happens. Verse 4. Also bearing them, the apostles, witness, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. In the Bible days, the apostles had gifts of healing. Let me say this. The apostles also had gifts of raising people from the dead. They'd come knock on a door, and they would be giving this great message that nobody's heard, that somebody was virgin born. They died. Three days later, he arose from the dead, and most people would laugh you off the front porch. But he'd say, hey, listen, you have a, I noticed you got some beer in that, uh, beer in that um, living room. A beer is a New Testament word for casket. Somebody's dead in there. And they're laughing at them, won't listen to the message of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. They go in and touch that person in that casket. He's raised up from the dead, and I won't guarantee you this. Then he says, hey, listen, let me tell you about the virgin born, son of God, death, burial, and resurrection. They're listening now. But, folks, we have the word of God to back us up. We have the word of God to authenticate us. And so that which is uh, imperfect... Uh, passed away, and that which is perfect is the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's why tongues have faded away, and gifts of prophecy, and, get, and, and uh, gifts of knowledge. Uh, in the Bible days, they could look at somebody and tell something about them, and uh, now it's the Word of God. What I'm saying, all that is this, don't get hooked up on the oil. There's some jaybird in our town that's going uh, all over the internet with a Bible that, that uh, sheds oil. We've had some people that I know very carefully, uh, very uh, uh, in the past, not carefully, and uh, they're, they're promoting this, saying, hey, you ought to go down and see this man. He looks like an escapee from um, um, the Beverly Hillbillies or something. And I'm not making fun of him, but, you know, uh, Duck Dynasty. 
uh, you know, and he's sitting there on a pickup truck, and he's got a Bible, and the Bible, Brother uh, Larry, is in a tub of oil. And everybody around Georgia is talking about this guy in Dalton, Georgia, has got a holy Bible, an oily Bible. No, it's a holy Bible, amen? And I believe that is blasphemous. I believe that low rates the Word of God. I believe it's trickery. I believe it's idolatry. And I believe you ought to stay away from it. You know why? Because, folks, listen, we don't need signs and signals. What we need is the Word of God, and we need to read the Word, and we need to believe the Word, and we need to have faith based on His Word, not on some holy Bible, oily Bible, excuse me, that sheds oil. I could do the same thing, put a little vial of uh, oil in your, in your thing, mash it, and it comes out, and there's oil all over the place. But that, that, that oil is supposed to heal you. Baloney. Baloney. I'm going to tell you why. Because, folks, it's not in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, I'll believe it. If it, if, it, if, it, if it raises up the Bible as a standard, I'll believe it. If it lifts Jesus' name up, no. We're going to have, a, we're going to have, a, we're going to have everything going viral on the Internet and Facebook praising this Bible that sheds oil. They missed it. Folks, it's not the oil, it's the faith. Amen? It's praying. It's not a fake healer. It's Jesus Christ that heals, and I still believe He can form miracles by prayer. And He gets the glory, and nobody goes down the aisle with a, with a multi-million dollar ministry on TV saying, I'm the apostle. Ernestine Ainsley uh, used to have a ministry where he'd slay people in the Spirit, and he said that uh, tongues was the robe of heaven. And uh, where he got that, I don't know, but a, a lady went from Rocky Face Baptist Church up here to, to his crusade, and, and she had something they couldn't fake. And so they put her in a room for three hours. And after a while, he came by there in his little sissy voice, and he said, hey, y'all be healed after a while, and shut the door and left. She went back and apologized to her church, what she should have. Because, folks, listen, we do not exalt men. We exalt God. And, folks, this guy's a multimillionaire because so many people are so silly that they believe in an apostle, and apostles have faded away. Now, some of you are already mad at me, because I know you follow Ernestine Ainsley. But I want to tell you this, folks. We need to follow God and not lift man or celebrity up above God. And so I want to just straighten this thing out about the oily Bible. Folks, it's not the oil, it's the faith. And it's not the, some guy that's discovered a secret Bible. By the way, I believe it's low rate in the Bible, Brother Larry. You won't even let me put my iPad on top of my Bible. Every time I, I do it, you come by and rip it off and say, don't put nothing on top of the Bible. And Brother Larry, don't do anything loud and boisterous. He just has a conviction, no book ought to be on top of this book. And I don't believe no oil ought to be on top of his oil, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, yeah, I said all that to say this, faith is the difference. Amen? It's not in the oil. But folks, if, if the oil is a media and helps somebody believe Praise God, take it, because the Bible says take it. Take it to a person personally, anoint them with oil, and pray over them. That's scriptural, that's biblical, and I think it's, it's proper. Say amen, because it's in the book. It's in the book. I said all that to say this. This guy had a problem. He confessed it before all, and thank God, thank God, he was healed. He was healed. And then, he, then they said this. Those guys that went to pray over him, they better be effectual, and they better be fervent, and they better be right. And that's what I want to preach on, is that how can we be in the, in the ministry of reconciliation and, and restoration and, <clears throat> and, um, and uh, intercession and really pray? I don't know about you, but I got some big prayers on my heart. I got some very big decisions to make in my personal life. I got some big prayers that I want to see answered. And folks, I want to be right with God so I can have those prayers answered. For God's glory, not for mine. Not for mine at all. But I want you to turn back to James, please. And I want to finish this book. And I didn't mean to get off on that tangent, but I don't think it was a tangent. We need to deal with the crazy things that's in this world and rebuke them. <clears throat> but I want you to notice this. The Bible says, uh, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, he said the guy got confessed his sin. He got forgiveness of sin. And thank God that's the greatest miracle. And then he was healed in that order. 
But then they said, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It didn't say the prayer of faith by the sick person. It said the, the prayer of those people that went to him. But I also believe he had a part in it because he had to meet the conditions for answered prayer. But I want you to notice verse 17, and, the, and we'll close uh, the chapter out. It says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Now, folks, that's hope for all of us. That's hope for us that fall asleep when we try to pray all night. I'll never forget the time we prayed all night, and Brother Randy fell asleep and started snoring down here at the altar. We thought somebody was speaking in an unknown tongue. But he was here, and he was trying, and I'm not criticizing him, and he ain't got internet, so he can't even hear this message. But I want to tell you this, friend. I mean, I'm disappointed in that. I want him to chime in on it. But, uh, you know, I want to say this, friend, that, you know, I'd rather fall asleep trying to pray than not pray at all. Amen? I'd rather try to, try to pray and try to get a hold of God in my feebleness and in my, in my flimsiness and in my humanity. But I want to tell you something. It doesn't depend upon us. It depends upon Him. We've got a big God, and He's a prayer-answering God. And I want to tell you what's so important, folks, is that God wants to heal relationships in this church. He wants to heal marriages in this church. He wants to heal uh, uh, people that have been so hurt and damaged through prayer. And folks, it all depends on if we're going to make this place uh, a, a place of merchandise or a place of prayer. And folks, we should not lift up anyone or anything above the name of Jesus. And, and, and we ought to really be careful about that when we pray, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, folks, much means much. Number one, he was forgiven of sin. Number two, he had, he had a miracle of healing. I still believe in healing. Don't you think this Baptist preacher does not believe in healing? Matter of fact, if you're alive today, you've probably been healed. Say amen. I believe in miracles. Miracles. If you've driven in Atlanta, Georgia, over once, it's a miracle you're still alive. Amen? It's a miracle you got back. And I want to tell you something, if you've flown in a plane, it's a miracle uh, that plane got where it's going and got back. And so, folks, we see the uh, confession replaces condemnation. Confession replaces uh, criticism. But then we see the praying for one another. And, folks, the Bible says we pray that we faint not. The Bible says we ought to pray without ceasing. And the greatest privilege we have is to talk to a living God and get a hold of His will and let His will be done in our life. Hallowed be thy name, all for His glory. The greatest privilege you have on this earth is to glorify God. The greatest privilege on this earth is, is that you pray and the prayers are answered and He gets the glory. Not some celebrity, not some oily Bible. And I won't, I won't even mention that again, I promise you. It's too, it's too obscene to think about. Prayer is Christian service. Prayer is one of the ultimate ways to serve God. And the Bible tells us we ought to pray one for another effectually and fervently. And I'm afraid that we're going to take on more missionaries and not pray for them effectually and fervently. We do not need to go through the motions to light up a space on that map. We need to realize all hell is trying to stop that young couple and that other young couple and that older couple and that couple with 10 kids from being on the field and remaining on the field. Matter of fact, let me just say this. If we don't pray for one another, a lot of people are going to be disqualified from being a missionary before they even become one because they'll have a marriage that, they, that, that goes awry and they can't be a missionary, can't be a preacher. Uh, they'll have heartaches. They'll, have pain. Uh, they'll, they'll get mad and kill somebody and have a jail ministry instead of going over to Ethiopia. I mean, folks, sin short circuits everything. Sin causes us not to fulfill the will of God. And so there is no little sin. And we'll find that out in just a minute in our prayer life. But we need to be effectual. That means we need to be effective. We need to be successful at praying. If there's anything that we need to major on being successful at, it is praying. God did not call us to preach all the time. God called us to pray all the time. And it needs to be fervent. Intensity with integrity is the key. Look at that verse again. Elijah was a man subject to like passions. 
I can prove that in verse nine, chapter 19. He was depressed and running from one Jezebel. He just defeated 850 prophets, and now he's running from one Jezebel. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. He was weak. And then he said he was the only one. That's pride. And then the Lord put him in his place and said, hey, it's not in the whirlwind. It's not in the earthquake. It's in a still, small voice. I'm going to speak to you and tell you you're not the only one, big boy. And, and God is God, and you can be used of God if you'll just believe God. And that's after a great miracle. God wants to stop you right after a great miracle, especially salvation. He will jump you with everything he has. But we need to be stretched out, and that's what the word fervent means. Effectual, fervent prayer is in the Greek means stretched out. That means like a, a, an athlete running for the finish line stretches himself to cross that line. And that's the way we should pray, earnestly, fervently, passionately. A passion for souls means that we have a passion to pray. And folks, the dining room is full and the prayer room is half empty. God help us not to have a lukewarm, take it or leave it prayer life in this church. It's not a recitation. It's not a routine. And it's not a ritual. It's fervent. And the root word for fervent means on fire. We must get on fire when it comes to Praying, intensity. Let me give you another word. Desperate. Desperate. It's amazing to me that sometimes it takes tragedy to get us desperate in our prayer life. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot more fervency in the emergency room than there is in the prayer room of the local church because we get desperate. Your little baby can't breathe. That's desperate. Your mother or daddy has a heart attack. You're desperate. But folks, I believe that we ought to be just as desperate if our baby's going to hell and our mom and daddy does not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior or somebody else's mom and daddy's going to hell. Desperate. And that means laid out, stretched out. It's not the posture of the body, it's the posture of the heart drawing nigh to God. Going nigh to God. But I want to close with, with this because the Lord led James to mention it. Elijah was a man of subject to like passion. James used the character of Elijah's praying to illustrate how we can get our prayers answered. If you'll turn back to 1 Kings chapter 18, and I've already covered half of 1 Kings chapter 18, but I want you to notice where he not only prayed for fire, but he prayed for rain. You know, we need the fire, we need the purging, we need the conviction, but I want to tell you something, we also need the blessing. We need the rain. We need the, we need the blessings of God's presence and refreshment and power and peace. Folks, rain is a, is a, is a wonderful thing when you, after a drought, three and a half years of a drought, and every drop is precious. Every drop is refreshing. Every drop is life-giving. I know it's a sign of revival. And, and, and folks, listen, we ought, to have the, we ought to let the rain come. We ought to pray for the rain to come. But it's spiritual rain. And folks, the heaven became brass and the land was, was, uh, was in a state of famine for three and a half years. And in verse 36, he prayed a very simple prayer and he came to pass at the offering of the evening, 1 Kings 18, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. First of all, he was convinced of the reality of God, that he's a living God. He said, let it be known that this day thou art the God in Israel and that I am thy servant. And he was also convicted that he was just a servant. That's important when you go to pray it. It's not in your fervency, it's in his faithfulness that we have prayers answered. And it says that I have done all these things at thy word. And then we see that he was also convinced of the, of the reality that he had the word in prayer. In Deuteronomy promised that if a, if a land was heathen and turned from God, that he'd send famine. And so he was just fulfilling the word of God in his prayer life. But then listen to this. It says, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of God fell 
and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the waters and that was that was in the trench. Now, folks, that's some hot fire if it starts licking up stones, amen, and dust. And when all the people saw it, verse 39, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, He is the God. The Lord is the God, not a God, the God. And Elijah said to them, take the prophet of Baal, let, let one of them escape, not let one of them stay. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kirsham and slew them there. And Elijah said, Ahab, get thee up, eat, drink, for there is a sound of the abundance of rain. Now he prayed for the fire. He killed every one of them, slayed them right there by the brook Kistrom. That, that, is, that is a prophet, uh, prophetic uh, duty that I wouldn't want to have. And it says, And Elijah said unto him, Ahab, get thee up, for I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Number one, if we're going to have effectual, fervent prayer, we've got to believe it before it is so it can be. They, they, he heard the sound of the abundance of rain when there was none. But he knew God said it. And so he heard the word of God on this. And then we see, he says, So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and cast himself down into the earth and put his face between his knees. And so, folks, number two, we see uh, the place of prayer, top of Mount Carmel. It's a solitary place, off by itself. Let me just say this. If you don't have a place of prayer, you don't have much of a prayer life. Because if you don't have a place of prayer, you're probably not praying. There needs to be a dedicated place of prayer. I like to come down here at this altar during the week. I like to come down here early on Sunday morning. But I don't do that enough. But I've got a place. I've got a little uh, office. It used to be Jason's bedroom. As soon as he moved out, I said, glory to God, it's now an office. And it's a study. Not that I want to get rid of it. But, you know, uh, it's, it's a good day when your son gets married. Praise God. But, uh, you know, you don't want to be single the rest of their life. And, uh, and so that's my dedicated place. It's a little chair. I bought it for $50 at a yard sale in Varnell, Georgia. It's a great chair. The reason it's a great chair is a great altar. And that's my place of prayer. I was there this afternoon praying for a big prayer. I mean a big prayer that I've been praying for for many years. And I believe God's, I, I hear the abundance of rain. I, I feel the presence of God on this. I believe God's moving. I believe God's providing. And I, and I claim that this afternoon. In, in fervent prayer. And then, and, and, and I want to say this, there needs to be a secret place. Maybe I shouldn't even told you where it was, but I'm sure y'all not going to crowd me out. But I'll tell you this, the devil might, amen? And boy, we're busy. We get up. We get going. We want to exercise. I got my, I got my uh, elliptic machine right next to it. I got my treadmill in the back. They make good coat hangers, praise God. And I, and I used to have a bicycle, but it was crowding out my place of prayer. And folks, I want to tell you this. Thank God for the place of prayer. Everybody ought to have a place of prayer. I know Brother Lamar has a place of prayer out in the woods somewhere. Praise God. And that's good. Some people have altars of prayer out in the woods. Some, I remember one time I preached this and a, and a lady uh, uh, named Deborah. And uh, I remember she, uh, her husband called up and said, My goodness, preacher, I cannot find my wife. She's gone. She's finally left me. I said, Oh, y'all having that bad of problems? And, he, and, uh, and I can't find her. I've looked everywhere. And they looked and looked and looked. He said, could you, could you pray about me finding my wife? I said, Sure, I'll pray. Lord, help, her, help him find his wife, poor guy. Can't keep up with her. And I prayed. And then he called me back and says, I found her. I said, Where was she? She said, She's in the closet praying. You, pr- you preach Sunday night, go into your closet and pray. And she was in her closet praying under the, under the, under the old uh, blankets. And she was hid, and I couldn't find her. And I thought, well, praise God, she took it literal. But closet means closed out. It means solitary place. And then not only do you have a place of prayer, but you have a posture of prayer. Look at verse 42. It says, and he, he put his face between his knees. He put his face between his knees. Down, down upon the earth. That reminds me of a person about to faint. You've got to put your face between your knees and put your face in a brown paper sack or whatever you can to get breathing. Folks, life is your, is your breath. Uh, exhaling's praise and inhaling's prayer. There ought, to be a, uh, there ought to be a walk with God. There, it ought to be literally your breath. It ought to be your, the bloodline. And folks, listen, here's a man bent over, broken, stretched out. I mean, just humble. Folks, There's a reason we do not pray. We're too self-sufficient. We're too prideful. We just think we can make it without Him. We need to get desperate 
But we can't make it without Him. We need to pray passionately, powerfully. Luke 11 says we ought to keep asking and knocking and asking and knocking. Seek, uh, ask and seek and knock. Ask and seek and knock. And the, and the, and the verb tense of that is, is, is actively keep on knocking and keep on asking and keep on seeking. And folks, our prayer life should not be just a flare prayer. You know what a flare prayer is, don't you? You're in the intersection, you see two lady drivers coming at you, and you say, oh, God, help me. That's a, that's a flare prayer. And all you ladies say, I've seen some men drive worse. If you rode with me, you know I drive worse. But I'll tell you this, folks, ask and seek. Don't just use God as emergency rations. Have Him as daily bread. Amen? And every day, find a place of prayer, passionate. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 5 and uh, verse 7. Hebrews 5, verse 7, please. The Bible says this, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, two different words, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Folks, the Bible says that Jesus prayed with strong crying and tears. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible and the one that you memorized first. But folks, listen, he didn't just weep. He wept with strong crying and tears. When's the last time? When's the last time you shed a, pray, uh, shed a tear in prayer? And I'm not saying when you were hurting. You felt like, we, but you was hurting for someone else. God help us. Not to be dried-eyed, matter-of-fact, duty-bound prayer warriors. Folks, we need to be broken. We need to be contrite. And we, need to, we need to pray as Jesus prayed, laid out. When people are sleeping, we're praying. When people are backsliding and cussing and denying us, we're still praying. We're praying that the devil won't sift them. Prayer is hard work. Prayer is a passionate work. And folks, we see not only the, the uh, posture of brokenness and intensity, but I see integrity. The Bible says a righteous man. That means, number one, you need to be saved. I, I, you know, people debate this, but there's no debate. You cannot have your prayers answered until you're saved. You can have one prayer answered, Lord, save me. But I want to tell you something, friend. The only way to be righteous is saved. Righteous man availeth much. That means in his righteousness. And folks, you're pleading his blood. And you're approaching him by the escort of heaven, the Holy Ghost, that knows God better than you know God, knows you better than you know yourself, and knows the will of God better than you know the will of God. Amen? He's the intercessor for Jesus. He makes him real. And so we need the escort. It's a pure life. It's a clean life. And day by day, we'd all be an obedient life. And before you can pray for God's will to be done, you better be living it. Amen. So there's a condition for prayer. And then last but not least, I see the persistence in prayer. Not only the place, not only the posture, but I see the persistence in prayer. Look at verse 43 back in uh, 1 Kings 18. I'm sorry we, we turned from there, but maybe you can find it again. By the way, our faith promise went up $10,000 since the First of the service, that's good. It's up 36,000, that's good. But I want you to see uh, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 and, and verse, um, uh, and I'll try to close this out, uh, verse 43. It says, And he said to his servant, Go up and look towards the sea. And he went and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. Now, folks, I know God's perfect number is seven, but I believe what he was saying is keep on knocking, keep on asking. Keep on praying. God's delays are not God's denials. He's preparing the way. He might be preparing you for the answer, or He might be preparing the answer. But folks, we're so instant. The other morning, I, I took a chance and cooked my own instant grits. Cut the package, put it in the thing, and then went to my wife and said, how do you do this? I, I mean, that's, that's deep. 
And, you know, it was pretty good. It, it tastes like grits. Amen. But I'm, we're instant grits. We're instant potatoes. Uh, we're instant. Your, the computer does not uh, respond in five seconds. You slap it and say, I need to get another one. This thing's got old on me. Say amen. The internet goes out and winds. That little clock winds 30 seconds. And you lose your sanctification waiting 30 seconds. We're an instant society. We've got to have it now or yesterday, but not before. But folks, we need to wait on God. And waiting on God is the hardest thing in the world. But when we wait upon God, we'll renew our strength. and We'll mount up with wings as eagles and we'll fly. Amen. We'll run. And then we'll fly. And we'll, re- we'll arrive for God's glory. Every sin is big and horrible because it keeps you from having your prayers answered. And folks, I want to tell you something. We need to have a persistent, broken, intense prayer life because, folks, sometimes God's preparing us to be the answer. And through prayer, we're molded into His will. We're conformed into His image. We're broken from our sorry selfishness and pride and vainglory. And God delays the answer for a reason. I don't know why. I'm impatient as you are. But folks, it came to pass. Verse 44. It came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare the char- thy chariots and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Folks, just a little cloud. Uh, Folks, God wants to stamp something supernatural upon your life that the world cannot understand. And it's through prayer that God helps us to exceed our selfish flesh. It's through prayer that God gets the glory. God is magnified. I don't know about you, but I want an unmistakable stamp of God upon this ministry. And I want an unmistakable stamp of God upon me as a man of God. I want to see your homes blessed where nobody else can understand it except you and God because you asked. I want to see your needs met, not your greeds. God's not in the greed meeting business. He's in the need meeting business. I want your needs to be met. I want you to have a victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil that nobody can understand except you and God. And then when they asked, oh, when they asked, you can say it's God's glory. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. George Mueller. He read his Bible over 150 times. He memorized most of the book of Philippians and a lot of psalms, and he was a man of the word. He prayed in 750 million pounds, that's British for a lot of dollars, to feed the orphans. He'd never tell anyone his need. He said, I told God you asked him. Now most donators would say, what an arrogant guy he is. He won't even tell me what he needs. He said, no, I told God. And many times he'd have the milk wagon, uh, that Y'all, none of y'all remember the milk wagon, do you? I used to come by my house when I was a little boy. No. And, uh, and, and it would break down in front of his house, and they'd say, our milk's going to spoil. Do you need any milk? The potato truck would wreck right in front of the orphanage. And they'd have to go pick up potatoes all in the streets because they'd prayed for potatoes. George Mueller was a praying man because he was a fervent man. He was a faithful man. He prayed 50 years for a friend to be saved. 50 years. And that man got saved at his funeral. Don't put a time limit on it. But don't put, a, don't put any kind of limit on God's power. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Why do we want much? Because he deserves much glory. Why do, why do we need much? Because we can't touch the world. And we can't reach the world. And we can't even help the world. 
unless God, through these precious families, takes the gospel to a lost and dying world and opens up doors and hearts. But folks, they won't be there long if we don't pray. Their marriages will not stay the stress and pressure. There's a lot of pressure in the ministry. A man that his daddy got saved when he was 80, 73 years old and his mother got saved when she was 72, sitting right in the middle section back there on friend day. Came up to me today and said, Preacher, I'm not pastor anymore. He pastored Doug Yap Baptist Church. He says, because I could not take the stress of it after I got Parkinson's disease. But I'm still preaching. I'm still preaching. I said, Bill, we're praying for you. If we, you ever need anything, you, we got your back. And he smiled and said, I know that preacher. You have that reputation. Folks, listen. Big old tall boy. All he did was play basketball when he was in college and all he did was play basketball when he was in high school because he was so tall he'd probably become natural. Out of Rome's Baptist Temple. Good friend of Jason's, good friend of mine. We took him on. Now he's in a place called Burkino Farso or something. Ola, Ola, I don't know what it is. It's over there in West Africa. And that missionary was telling us, Brother Ruckman, that they were trying to raise some money because Brother Keith had won an Ahmad to the Lord, had won a pastor of the Islamic church to the Lord. And that man wanted to take the Bible, the Word of God that saved his unrighteous soul, and start a church. He was raising money to start a church. Can you imagine an ex-Muslim starting a church in West Africa? Well, it all started with a big old tall boy that all he could do is play basketball. But now he can pray, and now he has churches like ours that can back him up and give him air support in the warfare. And he can reach one Muslim pastor, Ahmad or whatever they call him. And that guy's now starting a church. And oh, how many Muslims will get saved? Because he said, I've been there, done that, and I'm out of that, and you need to get saved. <laughs> Folks, that's God. That's the stamp of God's genuineness upon Keith Shoemaker's ministry. That's the power that we cannot explain. It's the power that we cannot analyze. It's the fruit that remains. It's the fruit that brings glory to God. It's the fruit that's for eternity because someone prayed the effectual, fervent prayer. For that one missionary. And that's what we need to do as a church. Father, thank you for this message. Use it for your glory. Lord, I knew we wouldn't finish James chapter 5. We'll do it again. But dear God, help us to get caught up in this fervent and faithful and righteous praying. Not for our righteousness, not for our name's sake, but God for your name's sake. Lord, sometimes I'm embarrassed about my prayer life. Lord, I know that I'm not qualified even to preach on this, much less try to get some other people to pray. But dear God, I want to do better. And God, I want to be a better shepherd to pray for these folks that have so many needs, so many heartaches, so many challenges, so many lost loved ones, so many wayward children, as those last two verses say. God, help us. God, help us not to play at this prayer game, but God, help us to fervently stretch ourselves out and to weep and to be broken. And God, to have faith and to be right as we pray all for your glory.